you permission. Good evening, everyone. It is so good to be at Decatur Bible Church. Thanks for coming back out tonight. It is a joy to round out the night, the day, I should say, in the evening service. I told someone this morning, you have convinced me that wherever two or three Christians are gathered, there will be a meal. Seniors, go to Chocolate Factory. I wonder if that's like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. But uh, then we go to Golden Corral. Now, I'll tell you a story about Golden Corral. I was there, uh, I was speaking at a church, and we went, they took me to lunch at Golden Corral. And this one worker was preparing. It was a whole steak, none of this, you know, cut up stuff. It was still intact. And talking about temptation, I was tempted to say, sir, I'll take that. Don't cut it up. Don't do it. I'll take that one. But I didn't. But uh, Golden Corral, that was really my story of Golden Corral. Oh, I like Golden Corral. Nothing wrong. But it just makes me laugh that we, as Bible-believing Christians, love to eat. Jewish people do, too. Jewish people do too, so we have a great uh, connection on that. Let's move from the ridiculous to sublime. Let's go to prayer. Father, we come this evening and we rejoice in you. We thank you for what you have done for us. We thank you what you are doing through us. And God, we just ask that you'd use us more. Now, we commit our evening to you, and we thank you that you are the sovereign God that hold time, nations, history, all in your hand, that you might be known globally, that your name would be exalted among all nations. We long for that day. In Jesus' name, amen. What is this world coming to? For the child of God, it's coming to the rapture of the church. The next event on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture. He is going to come for us. And he will come in the air. He will call us to be with him. And uh, what a glorious day that will be. Sounds like the name of a hymn, doesn't it? What a day that will be when my Jesus I will see. And then following the rapture of the church, will be that seven-year period of tribulation. Oh, I thought maybe I'd done something wrong. In fact, let's make Bible prophecy understandable, shall we? One-third of the Bible is prophetic. Let me give you seven words to help make sense of Bible prophecy. There was a student taking his exam, and he opened his exam and wrote three letters. The prof was right there by his, his desk. And the student's three letters were I, A, K. And then he closed his exam, turned it over. The professor looked at that and he said, son, what do the letters I, A, K stand for? He said, I am confused. And he said, son, confused isn't spelled with a K, it's spelled with a C. He said, prof, you don't know how confused I am. When it comes to Bible prophecy, maybe you feel the same way. Views and all kinds of interpretations. How do we make sense of it all? Well, let's go back to what we said this morning. God did not put the promise of his coming to debate. He put it in the word of God to be a comfort to us. Wherefore, comfort, not club, comfort one another with these words. So let's go. 
Seven words to make sense of Bible prophecy. Here we go. First one is the word rapture. The Lord Jesus is coming in the air. He will take us to be with him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. May that day be soon. Following the raptures, word number two, tribulation. The tribulation. There is a difference between tribulation and the tribulation. Tribulation is... The Lord Jesus said, the world will have tribulation. Hasn't that been true? We find that daily. Uh, New York City got all shook up over the weekend. And uh, when the earthquake did hit, and interestingly enough, there's a fault. We'll get into that another time. Tribulation, everyone experiences. But the tribulation, that is what's going to come on the earth. It is a seven-year period. How do we know it's seven years? Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Daniel's 70-week vision, 69 weeks, have come and gone and been fulfilled. Messiah came, died, was buried. The temple was destroyed by Rome, 70 AD. And now there's still one seven-week period, that seven-year period, remaining. Seven years, that's how we know it. It is the 70th week of Daniel. Following the rapture of the church, that 70th week of Daniel will ensue. When does the tribulation actually start? It's a very important distinction. It's not right after the rapture. The, the seeds, of, the grain of sands of time start going down when the Antichrist makes or confirms, strengthens an existing covenant, that's when the tribulation begins. That's when that seven-year period begins. With that contract, that covenant between Israel and the Antichrist, he guarantees Israel secure borders, guarantees Israel safety. But Paul writes, be careful when they promise you peace and safety. Right in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. For when they promise peace and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them. Number three, revelation. Revelation. The Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end and will come in power and glory. He will defeat the enemies of Israel. And the world, his enemies, crush them, and then he will be exalted. He will set up his kingdom. That's number four. That is the word millennium. Millennium, M-I-L-L-E-N-N-I-U-M, the millennium. A thousand years of reigning over the earth. Perfect government. It'll be an awesome time we will be with the Lord Jesus, ruling and reigning. I don't know who's going to be the mayor of Decatur in the millennium. I don't know. But uh, maybe it'll be one of you. I don't know. But the world, we'll be reigning with him. Following the millennium, Revelation chapter 20 states that Satan will be released one more time. Rebellion. Following the millennium, now think about this. You have had perfect government for a thousand years. You will have had perfect employment for a thousand years. You will have had a perfect economy for a thousand years. And Satan comes and he raises up rebels, thinking they can overthrow Jesus Christ. Really? Really? No. The rebellion is squelched according to Revelation 20. Then word number six ensues, judgment. This one is the great white throne judgment. Not one believer will be there. Not one. This is the judgment of the wicked dead. The books will be open and the proof will be given. They have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And they will be escorted to the lake of fire where they will reside for eternity. Hell is as eternal as heaven, folks. 
hell is as eternal as heaven. Word number seven, eternity. Revelation 21 begins, he made all things new. New in kind, new in quality, new in nature. This is not a renovation, folks. This is brand spanking new. Eternity. When we were attending Farmington Hills Baptist Church, it was a Sunday night service just like this. The service concluded. My wife and I were talking with a couple in front of us, and the lady turned around and she said, Tim, when we get to heaven, will anything happen to put us back on this track of misery that we're experiencing now? And I said, ma'am, I am delighted to tell you no, no. We will be living, work, serving. I love this statement. His servants shall serve him. Bill Gaither had it right, dear ones. He had it right. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Can you imagine doing that for eternity? What a day that will be. What a day that will be. So there you have seven words to make sense of Bible prophecy. Let's see how well I, I did. Word number one, rapture. Tribulation. Revelation. Millennium. Rebellion. Judgment. Eternity. All right? Let's do them together. I'll go slow first. We'll do it a couple of times. First I'll go slow, then we'll speed it up, and we'll see how good we can do. All right, here we go. Um, I'll review it. Rapture, tribulation, revelation, millennium, rebellion, judgment, eternity. All right, let's do it. We'll do it together. Count of three. One, two, three. Rapture, tribulation, revelation, millennium, rebellion, judgment, eternity. Good, good. Let's do it a little faster. Rapture, tribulation, revelation, millennium. Rebellion, judgment, eternity. You got it. Seven words to make sense of Bible prophecy. Now, join me in the book of Genesis, chapter 11. Because what I want to talk about tonight is what is this world coming to? For the church, the rapture, for the nations, for the world, it is coming to a one-world government, a one-world economy, and a one-world religion. Why those three? Why? Well, in Genesis chapter 11, we get a glimpse of that. It was the first time since the fall and the flood that there was one world. And Genesis, Moses underscores that in 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 1. Now, the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found in the plain, a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had Give me this, asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord God came down, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down 
and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. They were going to call this city Bab L, B A B hyphen E L. Babel is the gate of God. They had three desires. Let us build a city, let us build a tower, let us make a name for ourselves. I've thought, why is God bringing the end of history down to a one world economy, a one world religion, and a one world government? Because folks, this was the first act of human rebellion after the flood. God wanted them to move out across the face of the earth. They were going to stay right here in Shinar. By the way, where is Shinar? It is also in the area of Babylon. Babylon. Revelation chapter 7 says that Babylon is the fountainhead of evil and error. Mystery Babylon, the great whore. By the way, that is the false church of the tribulation period. The true church has been taken out. The false church will be put in. Who is a member of the false church? Thank you for asking. Those who rejected the gospel, who thought like Cain, that I can do my own works in my own name and God will accept it. There is the rejection of the truth of God's revealed way. I'll do it my way. Cain brought the best. Wasn't anything wrong with his offering. He brought the best, except for one thing. He rejected the truth that he needed a savior. He came his way, not God's way. That's why he becomes this example of false religion. That's in Jude and Second Peter. Now, a city, a tower, a name. The city is a political entity. The tower was a religious. The community. Now we have a civilization. Now we have a civilization. Now we have a nation. Now we have a grouping of nations coming together. Doesn't that sound like the United Nations? All the nations coming together to bring peace. What's the problem with that? Can man make peace? No. Because he has turmoil in his own heart, dear ones. He has turmoil in his own heart. We can't do that. We can't make peace. Now, move with me to those three potential events, components to the future. Join me in, let's start in Daniel 9. Join me in Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, we said that Daniel 9, 27 uh, is where the 70th week is revealed. Here we are. Let's start there. Start with a one world government.
We are hearing more today about a one world government than we have ever, ever heard before. There is, an, in fact, a political movement called globalism. Globalists, many are wealthy. A guy by the name of George Soros, who has funded all kinds of Trying to think of the word I want to use. Political movements seeking to overthrow governments and implement and develop a one world government. He hates the United States and so he wants to see the United States destroyed and he's doing all he can to do that. But he's not alone. A guy by the name of Bill Gates, he's one of those. But what do you do when two men of that magnitude, Gates has more money than, than Soros does. And you've got men who think that they know better than God. And they want to put together a one world economy, a global economy. We can remake our world. And as Klaus Schwab said, you will own nothing and you will like it. Dear ones, doesn't that sound like what happened in the Middle Ages with lords and serfs? And it's like, we overcame that. And you want to put us back? That is not progress. And yes, I'll get political. For Democrats, you can put a big C behind that today. Today. They're not progressive. If they said what they really were, they couldn't get anything because you have communists and socialists. That's what they are. This is not a, a, a Democratic Party that was for the common man. Now they oppose the common man. Now they want to enslave the common man. They'll talk about it differently, but that's what they want to do. They want a one world government and they want to be in charge. And it's scary because, because that's what we have believed, taught, preached for centuries, at least since the 19th century. We're in the 21st, so at least 200 years we have been teaching and preaching that this world is coming down to a one world government. Now we're closer to it than we've ever been. And we have people intending to do that. Did that give me time to find Daniel 9.27? Look with me. At Daniel 9.27. Then he, the Antichrist, will confirm a covenant, strengthen an existing covenant. Dear ones, Israel wants peace. They want peace. But in the words of the psalmist in Psalm 120, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. We mentioned this morning in Sunday school about the Hamas attack. We looked at that from Psalm 20. But let me help you with something. Do you know what the word Hamas means? It is a Hebrew word, not Arabic. It's a Hebrew word. It means violence. In Genesis chapter 6, just a few chapters earlier, God's word teaches that in Noah's day, the earth was filled with Hamas. Hamas. Violence. That pretty much summarizes what Hamas is all about, wouldn't you say? Now, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week, for seven years. There was a Jewish man in Beverly Hills, California, who contacted Friends of Israel 
and said, I believe from my study Jesus may be the Messiah, but I would like to go over my findings with a Gentile. Um, do you have a worker here that I could communicate with and we could uh, interact together with my study and my findings? We did. We do. We have a missionary out there. And so he met with our missionary. And he told our missionary this. He said, you know, if there comes on the world scene a man who offers a seven-year pact to Israel, I and a lot of Jewish friends with me are going to believe in Jesus at that moment. I told him, tell him not to wait that long. Do it today. If you're that close, do it today. Make the move. Cross the line of faith. In Daniel 9.27, the Antichrist will make that and strengthen that existing covenant. You can list the attempts that Israel has made for peace almost by geographic area. The Camp David Accords, the Y River Accords, the Oslo Accords. And so there have been attempts by Israel to make peace. They want peace. But there is no peace. 30,000 rockets have been launched into Israel from Gaza over the past four years. 30,000 rockets. Not to mention the attack of October 7 of 22 cities, 3,000 terrorists coming in and murdering 1,200 Israelis, 250 hostages, over 500 wounded. A one world government is the aim. Seven years is the length. And his aim is not good for Israel. This world is heading toward that one world government. How it's going to happen, who it's going to be, we don't know. But we do know this that before that can happen, we have to be gone. The second Thessalonians chapter 2 that Paul calls the restrainer. The restrainer. Why is God bringing everything down to this one world government, economy, and religion? Why? Here's my, in doing this study on Genesis 11, here's my thought. God is bringing it down because this is what mankind has always wanted. They wanted a life. They wanted an entire life and government and economy and religion without God. They joined the rebel, Satan. They did not serve the creator. They went their own way. And that is why God's bringing everything down. He's going to show them the fallacy of that decision. You chose the wrong way. Now, that's the one world government. That's where we're heading. Sidebar. Something I never thought about was in order to have this one world government, you actually have to prepare a generation to be willing to do it. Wow, welcome to COVID. Everything got shut down. Government said, we have to close our churches. We can't gather in church. Then governor of Virginia said, you don't have to go to church to pray. No, but I pray because I go to church when I'm in church. And we learn the value and the importance of fellowship together in a body, dear ones, during that time. 
now. I never thought of this, but look what we're developing in our generation of the schools, colleges, and lower level and upper level. America is bad. No patriotism. We don't want patriotism. Patriotism is wrong. It's racist. I never thought that you had to prepare a generation to be willing to accept the one world government. That you would have cradle to the grave government provision and you will own nothing and like it. And we have young people today, youth today, who think America is bad, patriotism is bad, communism is good, and give me all the free stuff. Interestingly enough, Senator Schumer made the comment that he was concerned the fact that we're not getting the employment that we should be. Really? You gave people during COVID more money that they could make at home. Uh, at, they could make more money at home than they can at work. And a whole lot of people said, yes. Yes. I never thought about that, but now... You put that component in, and now you know how you can have it. We've seen it. Now, let's look at a one-world economy. Just a few years ago at the G20 summit, Russia brought a coin that said, here is the currency of a future economy that would be a global economy. And now they're trying to bring in cryptocurrency that would be able to help provide a global economy. So we're seeing and hearing today more about a one world economy than we've ever heard before. Now what's really interesting is that third component, a one world religion, we're not really hearing about. But let me tell you a, an account that happened to me personally that really brought this down to reality. We were doing a conference. Friends of Israel was doing a conference out in Minnesota. My host um, was a retired naval officer and so we were in church that night, and I was preaching, and I mentioned in my message that the world is coming to a one-world religion. After the service, he came up to me, he said, Tim, we're going to have a very interesting time tonight. I'm going to give you some, uh, we'll have a dessert together, and then I have something to tell you in light of your message tonight. So we went home, had our ice cream, and he said, Tim, when you talked about a one world religion, when you talked about a one world religion, he said, let me tell you about a gentleman that I played golf with, a man by the name out in San, <laughs> only in San Francisco, of course. Um, you didn't hear that from me, okay? This Episcopalian bishop, Bill Swain, told him that his desire was to develop a one world religion that would have the same type of influence and authority as the United Nations does politically. He wanted to form a one world religion that would do that in religious uh, context. My host said, don't you know that's what the book of Revelation says is going to happen in the end time? And his comment to my friend was, you can take that book of Revelation, rip it right out of the Bible and put it in your back pocket. He was really serious about doing this, and he's begun it. 
He's begun it. He had a celebration at his church, sending them out with the evangelistic message of a one world religion. The name of his group, his organization, is called U-R-I. U-R-I. The United Religions Initiative. United Religions Initiative. Let's move back to just a couple of popes ago, he brought in all the religions of the world for a conference. And he had them all along the, po you know, the, the platform. And so you had pagans, you had cults, you had false religions, you had, you had it all there on the platform of the Vatican in Rome. Dear ones, do you know we're closer than we've ever been to the return of Jesus Christ? We are closer than we have ever been to the return of the Lord Jesus. A one world government in the works, in the move, they are seeking to bring that about. A one world economy, that's in the works, that's in the move. They're seeking to bring that about. Now we're hearing about URI, United Religions Initiative. Is this going to be that fulfillment? Don't know, but here is a man who's giving his absolute commitment to doing so, which is exactly what the Bible teaches in Revelation chapter 13, that the false prophet will make the world worship the beast. Dear ones, look up. Your redemption is drawing nigh. Look out. We need to look out because there are fields that are ripe to harvest. The stakes are high. It doesn't get higher than eternity, dear ones. It does not get higher than eternity. May you and I be busy about the Father's business. May we be faithful. Keep looking up. Keep looking out. Keep sowing. Keep serving because he is coming again. And it could be today. Maybe, perhaps, today. What a great way to end our service and go into the week. I hope you have a great one. It's been a great day to be with you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for your support of Friends of Israel. And I hope to see some of you, many of you, all of you, as a matter of fact, come to Grand Rapids and join us for our Honor Israel Night as we celebrate Israel and show our support for Israel in these dark hours uh, for our country. Do pray for, uh, I gave you her name. Let me re remind you of that. Her name is Romy. She is 23 years old. She was kidnapped on the 23rd, I'm um, sorry, uh, on uh, October 7, 2023. Um, she was kidnapped um, and was shocking. Uh, the car that she was in, all of her friends were killed. She was the only survivor of this attack. She was kidnapped. She was wounded. Um, her father um, says, we have not had any contact with her since October 7. This is now six months ago. And he said, we've heard from other sources that, that it appears that she is still alive, but we don't know her condition. Please pray for Romy. Here is one of 130 um, still held uh, in, in 
Gama, uh, Gaza. So please pray for Romy, put her on your prayer list. And not only for physical protection, we don't know her spiritual condition, let's pray for her salvation as well. And for her parents, for God's peace and comfort, and that God had used this to draw them to himself. All right, thank you. The Lord bless you. Did I teach you Baruch Hashem Adonai? Have I taught you that in the times that I've been here? Uh, if not, let's do it right now. I'm gonna, we'll close with that. Baruch Hashem Adonai simply means blessed is the name of the Lord. Baruch, blessed Hashem, the name Adonai, the Lord. Baruch Hashem Adonai. We have a hymn in our hymnal. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, would you stand with me? We're going to close with Baruch Hashem Adonai. And uh, we'll sing it together. We'll sing it through twice. The first time we're going to have to get, get a feel for it. But once you get the feel for it, you'll be ready for number two. And let it out uh, from the bottom of your heart. Baruch Hashem Adonai, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem Adonai, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem Adonai. Good job. Now, from the bottom of your heart again, here we go. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem Adonai, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem Adonai. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Um, Gary, why don't you close us in prayer, would you? Thank you.